I'm now happy that I can not only welcome you on day two, but also introduce uh, the keynote speaker who has been yesterday on our high-level panel. Uh, that is Walter Bertard, and uh, he is a professor for hydrology and water resource management and uh, or water resources at the Department of Civil Engineering and Envi Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College. And um, today I also learned that before that he has been postdoc by uh, with Keith Barron, uh, Bevan, a uh, very famous hydrology uh, expert, uh, renowned internationally. And he has been also, as I mentioned yesterday, very active in this region of the world and in general in mountain regions. And uh, so he is going to share today his experience uh, on the topic of co-producing climate adaptation strategies for mountain water security. And I'm sure you will not only talk about this region, but with a certain emphasis. So also many participants are from this region. We are here in the region, so I think it fits very well. And um, sharing the, 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 the scientific basis that, that is important for it, but also how science can be converted to adaptation strategies, which ultimately, of course, is the more important, but also the more complex challenge ahead of us. So, Walter, thank you very much for sharing your experience once more with us. Uh, and you have, of course, 45 minutes, even though we started uh, a bit late. And um, I will check in the meantime uh, how we organize the question and answer session. Uh, but first of all, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank, thank you very much, Lars. Buenos dias a todos y todos. Good morning. It's a real honor to be here and have 45 minutes of your time. It's also a real pleasure to be back in Cuenca. In fact, it's almost 25 years ago that I took my first trip outside of Europe and landed here in Cuenca as an, uh, a young MSc student with only a few words of Spanish uh, to do my uh, MSc fieldwork and later on my PhD on the hydrology of high mountain and the ecosystems, those that you see around us when you go out and look around you. So I've taken the liberty to uh, go take a little trip down memory lane, dig into my archives and dust off some old papers uh, that, that I wrote together with uh, uh, friends and colleagues here from the University of Cuenca. But don't worry, I'll not only talk about the Paramo. Uh, indeed, in those 25 years, I've had the, the, uh, the great opportunity to work in many parts of the world. Uh, other parts that face similar challenges as um, uh, Ecuador and, and Cuenca, related to an extremely diverse and complex um, hydrological system, severe challenges in terms of water security, in terms of um, environmental degradation, climate change impacts, interact with a lot of different people, come into very different uh, social and, and cultural environments. And what I'll try and do in the next 40 minutes or so is condense some of those, those thoughts um, and uh, launch some ideas as to how we can uh, foster a, um, uh, the co-creation of climate change adaptation strategies. And as a disclaimer, I won't come with a solution. I don't think there's something like a recipe for climate change adaptation. Unfortunately, that's not yet the case, it's scientifically still elusive. But what I'll try and do is at least give you some ingredients that I think are key in that recipe of um, co-creating locally relevant, locally adjusted um, and cost-effective climate change uh, adaptation strategies. And it's only my name here on the, on the slide, but in fact, uh, what I'll present is a result of interaction uh, with many colleagues, uh, collaborators and friends all over the world, but actually many of which also sit here uh, today in the, in the room. Uh, too many to fit on the slide, but I'll try and, and mention as many as I can uh, throughout my, uh, uh, my slides. So as Lars mentioned, um, I'll try and focus a bit on, uh, uh, on the region here, at least if I manage to get my slides moving. Uh, should I come closer? Yeah. So for those of you, for those of you not familiar with Andean hydrology, uh, a good place to start is André Garro from the University of Chile's um, great overview paper about the hydroclimate of the Andes. 
showing clearly how the Andes is really a melting pot where different synoptic patterns come together. Uh, the, uh, uh, the systems over the Pacific, the von Humboldt current, the uh, El Nino current really clashing here in front of the coast of Ecuador and Peru. Uh, the, uh, the trade winds from over the Caribbean coming from the, uh, the northeast uh, and uh, the, the jets and the Atlantic systems passing over deep the Amazon. And all those systems come together here, interact with um, the topography, the largest or the longest mountain range in the world, and create a system of unique diversity and, and complexity. And again, that's very clear if you just look around uh, and contemplate the different ecosystems that are the result of that interaction between the hydroclimate, the topography, the soils, and all the other environmental factors, including the driest place on Earth, a bit further south in Chile, what well, is probably the wettest place on Earth, the Chocó region in Colombia, if only they had a few more rain gauges to prove it, and basically anything in between. And in addition to that, that natural diversity and biogeography, we also have obviously a plethora of different human activities that have further altered that, that environment and uh, enhanced even further that, uh, that complexity. And of course, on top of that, we've got this phenomenon of climate change, and we're all familiar with figures like this that show clearly that we're on track for quite a severe uh, increase in temperature. Global warming, as I mentioned yesterday, accelerating that huge chaotic system that is um, the world's climate. And of particular interest for water is, of course, what that means in terms of precipitation patterns. Again, we accelerate, we give the system more energy. That means more intense uh, processes, bigger extremes, extremes in rainfall, but also extremes in droughts. Patterns that are very clearly starting to emerge, at least at a, at a regional level, as you can see in um, uh, figures like these from a recent paper by um, uh, Pabon uh, Caicedo. And actually, quite some time ago, with uh, Rolando and others here at uh, the University of Cuenca, we made a first attempt at uh, trying to assess what that means on a local scale. Because in the end, in hydrology, uh, we're interested in the, the catchment scale. What does that mean, for instance, in terms of river flow of the Pauta River Basin uh, that's, uh, uh, of, in which uh, catchment we sit here, and that feeds the, the largest hydropower plant of the, of the country? And uh, we did that, and we uh, pulled the... Um, uh, the, the projections from the, the climate models that we had back at, uh, at that time, uh, passed them through, uh, fed them through a hydrological model, and uh, tried to predict the impact on the regime of the, uh, the Pauta Basin, or the Pauta River, as you can see there on the right-hand side. And unsurprisingly, from already the figure here on the left, we see that huge diversity of uh, climate projections, that huge range, and obviously if you propagate that through a hydrological model, you get hugely uncertain projections. Um, you see there the, the envelope, the, the boundaries of the, the climate ensemble really generating huge margins around uh, the, uh, the current uh, regime of the, of the river. And obviously that's a big issue in terms of um, adapting to climate change. If we don't, if we don't know what's going to happen, uh, then of course it's quite difficult to, um, to start adapting. And indeed, by now, I guess we're all familiar with these typical fun-like uh, patterns and projections that, that show how we go further into the future, how that uncertainty inevitably increases, simply because it's more difficult to make predictions at um, longer time scales. And we all know already how difficult it is to predict tomorrow's weather, think, think alone about uh, pred uh, predictions about the climate in 10, 20, or even 100 years' time. And here, just a quick example of another study we did at the Amazon Basin uh, with a PhD student of mine, Zetzel Kafli. They're very similar, looking at really the, the uncertainties in, in this case, the, um, uh, the projections of river flow in the, in the Amazon. And obviously, climate change is not the only perturbating factor. There's all the other activities, all the other pressures on Andean uh, ecosystems and mountain ecosystems in, in general. From localized land use change, increased cultivation as a result of expanding geographical um, or agricultural areas, industrial activities, mining, for example, extremely relevant and important in, in the Andes, all the way to increases in water demand as well. Obviously, population growth means that we need to spread or to, to distribute limited resources over a large number of people. And I don't have the time to go into much detail, but just thought I'd, I'd pull up another uh, example of work we did quite some time ago, actually a start uh, about 20 years ago, on trying to quantify the impact of land use change on the hydrological response of catchments here in the Andes. And for example, here, the Paramo, which many of you are familiar with, 
um, is encroached by human activities, including cultivation, including um, uh, the um, cultivation of species, uh, exotic species like pine and eucalyptus, which obviously will alter the local, the local water balance, especially pine species consume a lot of water. If the water evaporates or transpires to the plants, it's not available to run off and feed the rivers that, um, uh, that run down from the, uh, from, uh, the Andes. And that's what you can see very clearly on the right-hand side, how these activities on the top, um, the, um, uh, the impact of um, cultivation, at the bottom the impact of pine, uh, pine plantation, how that really drops the, uh, the flow duration curve, particularly the, the low flows which feed, which provide the base flow which is so important for uh, water supply further, uh, further downstream. So those are all quite worrying trends, trends that of course we need to try and quantify as best as we can uh, to know what the future will hold and to think about uh, how we can, uh, uh, we can adapt, how we can manage a river basin in such a way that we minimize the impact of negative, uh, uh, negative changes and at the same time that we try and instigate positive changes that might offset some of the inevitable uh, impacts of climate change and others. And again, I won't give you a full solution, but I'll do is emphasize or dwell a bit upon certain ingredients, not necessarily the only ones, but ingredients of which I'm pretty sure from my experience that they are fundamental to support the process of the co-creation of uh, adaptation strategies. And I'll particularly focus on three types. One is observations, data, it's already been mentioned yesterday in the discussion and in several of the presentations, regions like the Andes, regions like mountain environments worldwide really still struggle with an acute lack of quantitative data about fundamental hydrological and other processes. Once we have those data, we can start thinking about, well, how do we design solutions? We can only measure the past and the current. We can't uh, measure the future. So inevitably, we'll need to use those data. We need to use those observations to make predictions, to evaluate what might be the impact of certain interventions. What are the benefits, potential disbenefits? What are the risks involved in making, in designing strategies, which are then implemented and might yield, uh, hopefully, the, the type of impact that we hope for, but not necessarily always um, uh, uh, emanates from uh, from those those processes and lastly we need to do that together the co in co-creation the co in co-development means that we're all in the same boat we really need to try to try and team up make best use of everyone's knowledge uh, and uh, ingenuity to come up with solutions that really give us the, the most robust cost effective and equitable uh, way forward um, wrong direction there we go first of all data I'm an engineer by training. I love uh, playing around with new technologies and I see great potential in a huge range of new technologies that are coming up uh, from the kind of sensors that are built, uh, that are developed for driving uh, or self-driving cars to avoid them bumping into other cars to a huge range of so-called Internet of Things technologies, mobile phones, uh, new radio technologies, satellites and all really provide us with a fantastic toolbox to develop new types of solutions, more robust, uh, cheaper sensors and all that we can implement in the places where uh, currently very few um, uh, observations are available. And so in our team, we've done quite a bit of work uh, exploring those technologies uh, and building sensors like here, quite low cost in the middle, um, oh, wrong button, uh, low cost sensors for measuring water level, uh, a fundamental aspect of, uh, of estimating river flow used for things like pairwise catchment comparisons, as I showed earlier, uh, but also uh, flood early warning, for example. And that's just one activity of a whole range of what is sometimes referred to as the maker community, uh, many groups worldwide using technologies, building new, designing new, um, uh, uh, new electronic circuits, building them uh, and coming up with systems that are cheaper, uh, easier to apply and uh, more robust uh, or more, more applicable to the specific problems that we face in, in hydrology. Again, going to the wrong direction. Uh, so a couple of examples of the type of applications that we've been able to do. One is, for example, characterize the, the high mountain wetlands, which we're pretty sure uh, contribute quite substantially to uh, downstream river flow, and especially further south are sometimes a bit in the shadow of the glaciers, which are those iconic victims of climate change. Everyone is concerned about glacier melt or glacier reduction for good reason, but it's of course not the only hydrological system that is impacted by climate change. Uh, and indeed, in many cases, other systems from wetlands to groundwater might actually be the dominant driver of future change in the way that they are affected by hydrological processes. 
So here, this is an example from work we did in the Vilcanota Basin further down in Peru, uh, using those low-cost water level sensors uh, to build many more, or to, to purchase or, um, or have available many more sensors than we'd be able to afford in the case of uh, buying expensive commercial sensors that allowed us to install an entire network uh, and, and get to grips with the spatial variability and the different behavior of different wetlands in the um, uh, in, in that basin. And as you can see on the right-hand side, so there's some results of the water level of those wetlands, and you can clearly see how they have very different behavior. Some continue to, to drain into the dry season, other leveling out very quickly. And again, these are the things we need to understand if we are to, to quantify their contribution, but also, for example, try and understand how uh, climate change might affect those wetlands, change their water balance, perhaps even change the, um, uh, the, the hydrophysical soil properties and others, uh, and what that might mean in terms of um, downstream um, uh, river flow uh, and uh, water availability. Another very different example that we started off in the, in the Himalayas, in India and Nepal, where the mountains uh, generate big uh, flood risk at the, uh, the foot of the mountains, and so a keen interest in um, building better uh, flood early warning systems. And here we've um, uh, worked with an NGO called Practical Action, who's very interested in building flood resilience in the context of climate change. Again, try and see how these sensors, this is a slightly different version using a laser, uh, which has different uh, advantages, the ability to, to measure from an angle, which is really useful in mountain environments where often you can't get above the river and make a vertical measurement. Uh, also bigger distances, which is important for the, the size of the river you can see here. And so explore how those new technologies might help with building local bottom-up uh, community-based uh, and low-cost uh, flood early warning systems. The left from Nepal and India, on the right-hand side, an installation at uh, the, uh, the Vilcanota River uh, near Cusco in Peru, where we're working with um, Tsunami, uh, the um, uh, hydrometeorological office, to compare uh, the, uh, the new technologies with existing technologies, because obviously uh, entities like Tsunami want to do rigorous testing before they adopt uh, new technologies. And teaming up with them is a great way to do comparative analysis, crash testing those new technologies until we think they're robust enough uh, to be deployed in operational uh, settings. Another aspect which I think is, is really in, uh, very promising and, and, and almost fascinating in those technologies is that a lot of it is completely open, what is called open hardware, which is the equivalent of open source software, uh, with which many of you certainly are familiar. Uh, so we really stand on the shoulders of giants. We use a lot of community-developed uh, software for specific uh, technology and functionality, from writing to an SD card to interacting with a specific chip or sensor. And that allows us to really develop those much faster than we would have been able to if we designed from scratch. And there's also even an, an interesting intellectual aspect to it in the sense that it fosters open innovation. Obviously, it allows spreading the technology, but also building local capacity much more quickly. And that is something that, is, that we're really interested in, in thinking about how open innovation might, for example, stimulate local capacity to build sensors locally, rather than having to import them from the US or, uh, or China or Europe. Uh, which, which is uh, cumbersome, not only expensive, not only because of the, um, the import duties that you have to pay, uh, but also uh, uh, much more cumbersome if, if ever a sensor fails and you don't know where to go or you have to wait for the engineer to come in and actually repair it. So local capacity for innovation, to, to me at least, seems a, a great opportunity uh, to enhance and, and, uh, and strengthen and make more cost-effective the collection of, uh, uh, of data. Now, obviously, data is only one aspect. What do we do with those data? Uh, and how do we use them to build and to, to come up with uh, cost-effective, with the best intervention? In the end, if we are to adapt to climate change, we'll have to take action. And especially on the, in the context of water, essentially one way to, uh, to, uh, to structure or to think about that is to consider that, that river basin, that geographical area, and think about, well, what is what are the best interventions that we can do? What's the best thing we can invest in our time and potentially our money uh, that, that gives us the best, the best benefit? Essentially, it's an, uh, an, an, um, an exercise of, um, uh, of cost benefits. Uh, what, what does it cost us to intervene, to build a dam, to implement nature-based solutions? And what do we get in return? And in the end, the decision maker needs to make a decision, decide on, well, what is really the best the most, the most applicable solution given the local, natural, and socioeconomic uh, context. 
And we tend to structure that into two phases, what we call ex ante. Before we make a decision, obviously we'll have to weigh the different options and, and evaluate them before we can actually implement and start measuring them. And that requires us to make estimates, make simulations, uh, make predictions about the potential impact, which for some type of interventions is relatively straightforward. If you build a dam, you're pretty sure how much storage capacity you'll get. If you invest in, for example, expanding a wetland, it might be much more difficult to do. But obviously, at some point, you need to take, make a decision. And then after that, obviously, it's important to follow up and see whether that intervention really yields the benefits that you anticipated. All models are wrong. We can make predictions, but we need to check them afterwards and see whether effectively uh, we got it right. And if we didn't, uh, why we got it, we got it wrong. And the toolbox we've got for the type of interventions is growing, growing tremendously. Obviously, we have the, the classic interventions, often based on so-called grey solutions, dams, reservoirs, canals, etc. But increasingly also, that additional set of interventions that we tend to call nature-based solutions, natural infrastructure, really different or interventions that really leverage the natural processes of the catchment, recharge, for example, natural storage capacity in aquifers. And uh, that might give us uh, additional tools, uh, different ways to achieve the same objective, for example, more base flow, potentially at a, a lower cost. And so that means that essentially what, what our exercise boils down to is to consider those different options, uh, grey solutions like canals and dams, uh, or different types of nature-based solutions, and really think, well, for a specific catchment, what is really the best solution, the most cost-effective, the most robust, uh, or what is perhaps the combination of solutions that gives us the, the best value for money, the best um, security for the, uh, in, in future conditions uh, versus that, that uh, uncertain um, uh, trend of, of climate change. So basically that's what we need, what a, what a catchment manager, what a river basin manager tries to do, weigh off those op different options and think about, uh, look for the evidence that helps them deciding, oh, we think that this, this option is better than, than the other. And to simplify, for example, if, if that uh, uh, catchment manager is, here we are, is considering, say, building an, a reservoir on the right-hand side versus restoring degraded wetlands, which might also achieve uh, increased storage capacity, we can use science to come up with an estimate of what is the storage capacity per dollar invested that you get from both, uh, both, both types of, of solutions. And that's obviously what, especially what the river basin engineers are quite good at, uh, at doing, uh, making those estimates. And for example, imagine that we get a better value for money uh, for the, uh, the restoration of wetlands um, compared to building an, a big and, and um, uh, an expensive reservoir. But obviously, as I mentioned earlier, all estimates are wrong. Or as uh, George Box, famous statistician, told us, all models are wrong. We can't predict perfectly the future. That's inevitable, and that will never change. So actually, those estimates are really indications or averages or whatever of an, a range of potential, potential impacts. And so essentially, it's, it's really essential to not just make a prediction, but understand, well, what is the, the potential uncertainty? And as Lars mentioned earlier, I've done, I've done a postdoc with Keith Bevan, who's a bit the, the godfather of hydrological uncertainty. So that really made me very aware of, of the fact that all models, by definition, are wrong. And really, we need to get to grips with that, uh, with that risk that we've got it wrong. And um, for example, um, getting to grips with the fact that nature-based solutions are much more complex, much more uncertain to predict. So actually might, even though they might look good if we, we do a quick analysis, actually still get a, uh, a risk that, that we get less, uh, less of an impact or perhaps even a negative impact. If the, the wetland is not connected to the drainage network, then rather it might rather enhance evaporation and maybe even reduce the discharge rather than enhance it. That's a risk that we can't, in many cases, we won't be able to discard entirely, and obviously a risk that we have to be very well aware of uh, when we make these kind of, uh, of decisions. And it's obviously even more uh, pr uh, complex than that, because very often, especially with nature-based solutions, we're looking at different types of benefits, not just water, but perhaps also biodiversity, landscape beauty, many different other benefits, or in many cases, we might actually have some, some disbenefits as well, negative side effects that we can't avoid, and that we have to account for or take into our assessment as well, and really look at that entire portfolio, that entire range of benefits and disbenefits, and assess what is really the best combination uh, of, of those uh, 
uh, benefits and disbenefits that really gives us the best societal value. And again, that's what a decision maker, the task of a decision maker, but where we as scientists can help with, again, providing the best evidence. And here an example of a study we did uh, further down in Peru, again, looking at the different ecosystem services, not just dry season base flows, but for example, also organic carbon storage, fodder production for the, um, uh, the llamas and alpacas that um, uh, graze in those areas, as well as biodiversity, and really disentangle the complex uh, physical processes that give us those ecosystem services, not just now, but also potentially in the, uh, in the future. But in addition to quantifying those benefits, obviously another very important aspect is trying to understand, well, who benefits and who disbenefits. It might well be that we get great base flow, which is great for people downstream, but maybe at the expense of a grazing area upstream, which might affect the, the, the local farmers that obviously need somewhere to put their, their cattle. So it's, it goes not, it's not just about identifying and quantifying those benefits, but also understanding who loses, who wins, uh, and uh, taking that into account when designing interventions and perhaps even including uh, strategies for, for some that win to compensate those that lose out. So it's a matter of also compensating and making sure that those interventions are equitable uh, and well distributed amongst uh, all those that are, that are affected. And here a quick example of an, a systems analysis model that another PhD student of mine, Clara Jimeno, is implementing in this case for the water supply system of the city of Lima in, in Peru, trying to get to grips with, with that complex socio-hydrological system and identify well, who is really benefiting, who is this benefiting, and what are the interactions between those different, different groups. And that brings me to the last part of uh, uh, my, my presentation. How do we do that together? So, so far, I've really focused on generating the evidence base, again, in the context of that, that concept of evidence-based decision-making. In the end, it's the decision-maker that needs to make those decisions, which are incredibly hard to do, incredibly complex, again, involving politics, involving making some people happy, others probably less. But at least I see it as, as my task as a scientist to provide that evidence uh, and to make the, 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 the life of the, the decision-maker, whether it's a, a local community or a high-level uh, national and international policymaker to really allow them to make that decision uh, with the best evidence that is possible. But that doesn't mean that we just provide that evidence and then step back. Increasingly, scientists and, and, and worldwide, we are aware that that's a really an iterative process, a process that requires a lot of interaction, uh, not just to, um, to adapt and adjust and, 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 and enhance and, in, and increase our, our knowledge, but also because we're very well aware that it's not just the scientists that come up with good ideas with the knowledge, but basically anyone involved has something to contribute, and we want to find a way to really pull that expertise, pull that knowledge together to come up with the best and most robust solution. And that can be summarized, that's really all about how do we do that process of knowledge production and potentially decision making in, in as inclusive, as, as um, participatory a method as possible. And also here, there's a lot of exciting opportunities we can, we can tap into. Globally, for example, there's now a huge interest from policymakers in this concept of citizen science uh, as a potential way to, to, to bring people in directly in that process of, of, um, of scientific discovery, collecting data, analyzing those data, um, linking them back to, to specific questions, and really the core element or the, the core goal here is to, to co-create knowledge but not just uh, any knowledge, but knowledge that is actionable, that allows a decision maker to really take action and improve their, their decisions. And that's really, if you will, the, the long-term goal and things like citizen science, but also new technologies uh, and other ways um, can, be, can be explored to see, well, how can we strengthen uh, that, that process? How can we implement that in an optimal way? And again, there's no single recipe or way to do that. Um, but here I just ex uh, show some, some examples, some experiences of how we've tried to do that, of how we, where we see potential opportunities to do better than we've done at, uh, uh, so far. And here I, re I should, should really refer to an, uh, an initiative that I've been involved in basically from the start back in 2009, which is called the Initiative for the Hydrological Monitoring of Andean Ecosystems, which has its roots in that pairwise catchment comparison experiment that I showed you uh, earlier on, where we saw, wow, this is really quite a, a big impact. For example, losing 70% of the base flow when you plant pines, that's, that's something that really should 
should be taken into account when um, when 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 um, uh, land use decisions are being taken. But the problem is, if you do that in a single location, for example, the um, uh, the, the highlands here, the, um, the headwaters of the Pote, then it's very hard to extrapolate that to other regions, again, because of that tremendous diversity in space and time of Andean processes. It's not because you see a 70% decline here in, uh, in the Machangara Basin that you'll get the same in places like Peru or even, even Chile. So we, we quite quickly realized that we can't do just one experiment. We just have to do that again and again and again to really cover that spatial, that spatial um, diversity and come up, see whether we can find robust trends, trends that in hydrology speak, we can extrapolate, uh, we can regionalize from a point uh, to a larger, larger region. And that led us to bring together basically anyone, uh, people that, that have a similar interest, not just scientists, but also NGOs, even communities that have that similar interest of understanding better what are the impact of, um, uh, of, of different land use activities on the hydrological response. And we started that quite small, reaching out to some actors in northern Peru, Nature, Concer Nature and Culture International NGO based in Pura, for instance, installed several catchments in the, the headwaters of um, the Pura Basin, uh, and that was more than 10 years ago. And as they say, the rest is history in those, those um, uh, 10, 15 years. That network grew and grew and grew. And at the moment, uh, we cover pretty much all the, the, the Andean countries and, and are uh, monitoring, or the network is monitoring more than 50 basins in the different locations that you can see how there on the right-hand side. And I'm afraid that probably the map by now is already, already outdated. But a great example of teaming up to really, um, to address this acute issue of lack of data, in this particular case, about those high and, uh, Andean ecosystems uh, of which we, we, we just know so little because the typical uh, statutory networks from the Inamis and Tsunamis of this world don't reach there because, of course, their budget is fairly limited and they have to focus on the regions with highest population density, which just doesn't happen to be the Paramos and, and similar ecosystems. So we tried and complement that by teaming up and uh, installing uh, relatively or as low cost technologies as we could uh, could um, uh, could afford and um, complement uh, and gather quite a unique uh, a unique data set and again i don't have the time to go into too much detail but uh, uh, boris ochoa who's here in the room has done uh, great work amongst others to analyze the data of uh, of emea uh, and for example show the spatial variability of different types of interventions cultivation livestock grazing and forestation in different ecosystems the paramos around here but also the Halka and the, um, uh, the Puna uh, uh, ecosystems further south in um, in peru and uh, in bolivia and again to to, um, to address that issue of spatial variability, of heterogeneity, of trying to find trends and see how impacts relate to local conditions of hydrology, meteorology, soils, and, uh, and others. And if you want to know more, there's some, uh, uh, some references, or Boris will definitely point you to some of the other papers that he uh, led, uh, as, well as, as well as others. And EMEA has also been for us a great opportunity to think a bit uh, more about how we close the knowledge creation loop in the sense that we as scientists obviously we like analyzing those data we like publishing those data and that's of course important because that contributes to the global knowledge base but we also want to make sure or even in a context like the EMEA network have an obligation to, um, to, to, to feed back to make sure that that knowledge also reaches back to the local scale can also help the NGOs the, the communities and others that also put a effort into that, that monitoring. And so it made us think about how can we best make sure that the knowledge doesn't only reach the scientific community, but also the local, the local levels of decision making. And with some support from entities like UNESCO, for example, we managed to implement uh, some really uh, community-based, what we call community-based knowledge production. We really, we, we teamed up with the communities, we went to the communities uh, and uh, set up workshops um, explained how scientific instruments uh, work, listened to them about their knowledge about the, uh, the, the local hydrology, and thought very hard, together with obviously social scientists, anthropologists, uh, and others that have much more expertise in those processes, and try and think about how you can integrate and really combine that knowledge rather than simply uh, replacing the local knowledge with, with scientific knowledge, because then you lose out on a tremendous amount of, um, of relevant uh, knowledge and, and expertise. And so we've been able to do that in places like Peru and Bolivia, 
uh, with the, the EMEA partners um, like the University of Cochabamba, University of Cusco, uh, but also, for example, in places like Nepal, working with entities like Practical Action uh, and local universities to, to really think about how to do that, what processes, uh, what, what theoretical frameworks to develop uh, to, to make that happen. And just one example of such a theoretical framework is that of uh, polycentric governance, which again, the social scientists that we worked with uh, br brought to us, to us and said, well, actually what you're trying to do is, is at a level of, of complexity, bring in new actors in that process of, of uh, data collection. And that inevitably means that your system moves more towards a polycentric nature. Uh, and that's, that really was for us a, a very powerful framework to think about how we are complementary, because obviously we don't want to replace uh, the, the other networks, but rather fill in the gaps uh, gaps where perhaps we might be able to use lower cost technology sensors that are perhaps slightly less um, uh, less precise, slightly less reliable than the, the core first level monitoring network, but still help us with really finding trends, complementing those inevitable gaps. And so here, just some, some concepts uh, that um, uh, we learned from social scientists thinking about how can you really make sure that those different activities integrate, combine, complement each other, give a bit of overlap, which is always good because that gives you certain resilience. If you have several sensors, one breaks down, then that's less of an issue when uh, uh, the, the only one you've got in, in the catchment breaks down. So it's all about optimization, but also, for example, thinking about resilience, robustness, complementarity, uh, and uh, some, uh, some level of, of overlap. And again, I don't have time to go into too much detail, but we'd be most happy to point you to uh, relevant, um, uh, relevant literature that we published. And of course, the last aspect that is, that is really important doing there is creating local capacity. And I mentioned that already in the context of the, 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 the technological innovation, for example, making sure that you invest time and effort in uh, reaching out, in conveying that information, documenting the, um, uh, the technologies, for example, with videos, uh, with online um, uh, manuals. For example, at the moment we're working with UNESCO to create an online um, uh, course, a so-called MOOC, on open hardware for environmental uh, sensing and water resources management as a way to really to reach out. Uh, we've got more than 50 participants now, and uh, that's uh, uh, just the first round um, all around the world and a great opportunity to really, without much traveling, uh, do capacity building basically at a, at a global level. But of course, at some point it is useful to go. So we also work with communities, uh, interact and spend time uh, uh, explaining what we are doing and also listening to uh, what uh, their, their knowledge and doing things like, uh, 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 like for example, developing uh, videos that explain the functioning of a rain gauge. Specifically, uh, Katya Perez, who used to work for Condesan, uh, is, has been tremendous in doing that kind of, uh, of outreach and developing that kind of, of, of material uh, to foster uh, communication and, and, uh, and interaction. And then just to finish off, I think another example of what I already mentioned yesterday in the panel discussion, how do we integrate uh, and, and make best use of that, that local and sometimes even indigenous knowledge? And just to give one example of a work we did with the team at uh, Condesan in, in Peru, and uh, Boris was also involved and then wrote up the subsequent paper, was about characterizing hydrologically an, a local practice that's called uh, Amuna, so Mamanteo, which is basically an artificial recharge system uh, where water is diverted from the stream. Uh, you can't see my pointer very well, but there at the bottom, you see the schematic of how water is diverted in uh, what is actually a leaky canal, a canal that just ends on the hill slope, allows the water to infiltrate, pass through the hill slope, and feed the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the wetlands and, and uh, uh, water bodies further downstream. And by doing so, the time delay means that water that is captured during the wet season might actually resurface during the dry season and as such enhance water availability during the dry season. Something that has happened in the Peruvian Andes and perhaps also in other locations uh, for many decades and even centuries, uh, but I was never really considered as part of formal uh, water river basin plans simply because it's never been really characterized or hard to quantify. And so by doing a simple tracer experiment with the fluorescent tracer you see there, we could quantify the residence time build a simple model and, for example, simulate uh, what would be the impact of deploying uh, amunas over larger areas in the headwater of the, um, uh, the, 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 the river basin that provides water to the city of Lima and uh, make simulations as to how it would affect 
especially dry season base flow. Uh, you can see here on the left hand side the natural flow pattern of the, um, uh, the Rimac and, and other uh, rivers that come from the, the mountains uh, and, and flow through the coast, which as you can see is very seasonal. And that seasonality is reduced with gray infrastructure, as you can see there in red, and where if we add uh, the Amunas, we can further capture that, that, um, that uh, wet season base flow and move it into the dry season. You can also see that the residence time of those uh, Amunas do not really allow to cover the entire dry season because they have a residence time of typically only a few weeks, but you can really extend uh, the stream flow into the dry season. So as such, it's not sufficient as a solution. You can't really replace all the gray infrastructure by green infrastructure. But what you can do is combine them. And for example, when the, the green infrastructure enhances the base flow, that means you don't have to extract water from the reservoir. So you can basically use the green infrastructure to make the gray one more efficient, more robust, or even more resilient towards any changes uh, that's, that, that emanates from future climate change. And I think it's a great example, not just of showing how you can really uh, recover uh, local local um, uh, practices and, and learn from those and even integrate them in your toolbox of catchment interventions, but also how you really can combine different interventions to build a solution that is more cost effective, more robust uh, and more future proof in the context of climate change. And that is basically all I wanted to tell you. Again, a little shout out to the fantastic EMEA community who has been a great um, partner on, the, on, the, on this, uh, this long road uh, towards uh, better and more sustainable management of mountain uh, ecosystems and uh, mountain water resources. Thank you very much. If there's any time left, I'd be happy to take any questions. If I may? Yep. <laughs> what a fantastic, what a journey. Uh, thank you so much for this great insights. Uh, you really uh, have uh, the, the great ability to package it into a nice storyline because it's so difficult to, to grasp so many different pieces of information, but packaged into a nice coherent story, I think uh, allows us to do that, even though you were covering so many different issues, uh, going the whole journey from monitoring to modeling to management. We like to call this the 3M. But then giving, giving all the nice examples, uh, especially from this region, wonderful. Um, I think I could not think about a better keynote to start the day with. <laughs> Thank you very much. But we have still some time. Uh, we started late, but um, I think we, it's okay to ask a couple of questions and you can ask, answer them. No? What, please. Please. Yep. Thank you. I'll, I'll take maybe three questions and then do as we did yesterday, uh, answer them one after the other as a way to make things more efficient. Thank you very much, yeah. Uh, Martin Petrick, U.S. to Sleepy University Gießen. I can only um, agree with Lars concerning the general uh, assessment of your presentation. I think that was a highly relevant overview and very, very stimulating. Uh, my question is with regard to the concepts you were talking about in the end. Uh, uh, in terms of citizen science and involvement of local communities, etc., I'd like to ask you for a def definition of indigenous knowledge. Um, uh, in fact, I did not fully get your point here in the last two or three slides that you were talking about. So, I mean, if you measure local water f flows with, with locally designed tools, uh, etc., contributing data that is not available in global databases, is that what you mean by indigenous knowledge or is that something else? Good. Again, I'll, I'll take the question and then, then get back to it. But let's uh, let's take a few more if there's uh, so some more hands. Thank, thanks, Walter. Great talk. Um, just to, to stimulate more interest in potential p new participants for the EMEA network, can you tell us approximately how much is low cost sensors? How we can get them? Um, how we how we can how we can begin to participate, how we can get no, more people participating in the, in the network. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Walter, for the presentation. And of course, I also heard you yesterday. Uh, one point, uh, maybe uh, if you can throw some light on, is related to the monitoring using low-cost sensors. So what we have seen is that, uh, you know, in, in many parts of the world, uh, that the acceptability of the results that we generate uh, through using low-cost sensor is very low, especially when we, uh, you know, talk to the government. 
So in that reference, you know, how we can make it more inclusive so that, you know, they can also feel that this is something, uh, data which is of use rather than something which is done uh, just as an academic exercise. Great, thanks. Uh, on the indigenous knowledge, uh, what, what I showed as, as the, the participatory, participatory monitoring, that certainly is not, not indigenous knowledge. Uh, one can even argue whether that's local knowledge. I think that's really an, an, um, an example of, of um, uh, co-production of, of, of data, participatory uh, monitoring and, and, um, and data analysis. Um, I can't give a, or I'm reluctant to give a, a formal definition of, of indigenous knowledge, given that I'll leave that to the anthropologists. What we really try to do here at least is to uh, to listen to people and to to see how how we can complement or best use uh, traditional science, including traditional monitoring, which in in the end uh, low cost uh, sensors are still a, a traditional form of of data collection. How we can complement um, and and maximize the value of um, of of what is already locally known. For example rather than go in and decide based on scientific principles, oh, we, knew, we would need to install our um, water level sensor here. Well, first discuss with the communities and understand, well, how are you managing the catchments? Which parts of the catchments do you think are most important for water supply? Uh, but sometimes people have already uh, safeguarded or, or closed off certain areas of, the, of the, the catchment because they know that these are crucial for water supply, so they don't allow the cattle to, uh, the cattle to go in. And so then we try and see, well, can we perhaps further characterize or add value to that knowledge by uh, making measurements and, and for example, um, giving further evidence about the effectiveness of those those interventions. I think the last example of the Amunas is a great example as well. Uh, we, we just add the science to provide an additional layer of evidence that can help with with expanding and, and, and um, uh, widening the, the use of those, those methods. I think that's really the approach we try to take. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very well aware there's still a lot to be done about, well, first of all, understanding indigenous knowledge and then also seeing how it can be combined. Uh, sometimes some people are even reluctant to call it integration, but rather establish a dialogue between different knowledge bases. We can I step outside my area of expertise as an engineer, but at least we try and, and, and interact and be aware of those issues and bring into our research projects people with, with that particular particular knowledge. On the low cost sensors, uh, it depends really what the cost depends on, on what you want to measure, but the water level sensors we developed are about $200, uh, which is not dirt cheap, but is for us the ideal uh, balance between reliability and quality and, um, and, and, and cost. You can make them cheaper, you can have sensors that are as, 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 um, as cheap as five, five dollars, but you get what you pay for. That's in the end always the case. There's no magic bullets, no magic technology that can suddenly make everything dirt cheap. But I think one big advantage of that, that open hardware uh, toolbox is that you can really think about, well, what is it that I need? What is the, 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 the accuracy that I need? What is the, the reliability that I need? And you, you, you design your system such that you really get what you, what you need, but nothing more. And that really gives you many more opportunities than, uh, than what's available on the market. For example, in the case of the catchment comparison, we don't really need sensors that are robustly staying there for 20 years. Uh, but what is on the market is tied to, to that kind of application because typically the, um, uh, the the national weather services who need that kind of reliability have obviously historically been the main client. So it just gives you more options and really more more opportunities to select to select what you need uh, and and nothing more. And for our application, for example, those two hundred dollar sensors are the sweet spot. They're reliable enough, accurate, accurate enough for what we want to do, uh, but not not more than than that. Uh, and where you can get them, I mean, we do sell them through the university, but I'm very reluctant to make publicity for our own business. What we really try and do is, is build local capacity, team up with local teams, uh, teach them how to build them, uh, and, and then basically have that, that knowledge locally, which in the end is still the best way, not just the most cost-effective way, but also the, the best way to make sure that there's follow-up uh, support if the sensor breaks down, every sensor eventually breaks down. So then it's good to know who to go to to, uh, to repair or to... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, to replace it, so we really try and and work as much as possible with with local institutes and see our our role more as capacity building than really selling the sensor. But if you're dying to buy one, approach me, and I'd be happy to tell you how to do it. Um, lastly, about about acceptability, that is a really crucial question. As they say in English, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The best thing to do is use the sensor, install them, collect the data, and show decision makers uh, the quality of the data, and particularly in the case of um, EMEA networks. 
work. I think we've been able to do that. Data have been published in, in, in journals like Nature Sustainability, which I think is a pretty good proof that, that the data are scientifically valid. Um, and so that is the best way to, to convince a policymaker, showing the, the, the potential of the technology, also being very clear, obviously, about the, the limitations. Indeed, those sensors don't have the same robustness of a Campbell station of £10,000, but often you don't need that. And so it's, again, understanding what it is that you need and make sure that you don't pay more than, than really what, uh, what you need. That said, especially in citizen science, obviously there's still a lot of science to be done about understanding the quality and limitations of citizen science data. I think in many cases they're much better than what policymakers like to think, but then it's the job for policymakers to be critical and to be cautious uh, about the, 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 the data and the evidence that they use. So that's, that's, that's fair enough that they challenge us to provide, to come up with that, that evidence of the quality. I'll leave it at that, I think. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I had the pleasant job to announce you. Now I have the unpleasant job to stop you. Uh, we would have liked to discuss much more. Yeah, once more. Uh, I think for me, you are the role model of the scientists of the future because uh, you are incorporating all the things we would like to do and we I think we need to do especially in a topic like water security and climate change I think we need transdisciplinary science that is working with and for the society we also need system science I think you have given great examples of how to connect and this is done by all let's say classical disciplines uh, that they can relate to systems in one way or another that would be the science that can connect us actually and last but not least open science you know that we as scientists have a commitment not only to share our knowledge in the classical way of publications but also to make it available in many ways and I think also uh, I look forward to the the, the the approaches of UNESCO under the open hydrology activities I think this is a nice initiative and you are very modest but many of the reports there of UNESCO also you have co-authored and and developed uh, as well so I think you have served the scientific and the wider community a lot. Thank you very much.